Good evening and welcome to the Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe. My name is Julianne Worden and I will be your moderator this evening as we travel along to Greece with our hosts, Apostolos Duras and Rick Steves. And now it is my pleasure to introduce one of our hosts this evening, along with about 2.8 thousand other households, Rick Steves. Hi Rick. Julianne, thanks for the introduction and thanks to everybody for tuning in. I believe this is night 20 on of our 22 night festival. And today the theme is Greece. I'm so excited to be welcoming Apostolos from Athens in just a couple of minutes. But I wanted to thank you for joining us and reminding you that today we are celebrating travel. We're celebrating our tour program and we're also just celebrating the opportunity that you have to choose any way you like to travel. Just equip yourself with good information and expect yourself to travel smart and you can. You know, we've been doing this sort of a alumni party thing for decades, literally here in Edmonds, about a half an hour north of Seattle. Every year until COVID hit, we invited all the people who took our tours the last year to Edmonds. And we'd have this series of parties. We'd have six of these big, massive parties where all the groups would come and they would have a messing of the scrapbooks and they'd have their reunion and we'd fly our guides in from Europe. It was so much fun. Love to do that. And then when our guides were in town, we rented every venue in town and we had our test drive a tour guide uh, event where each of the regions that were represented by our guides on our tour program, we'd have a talk just for that spot and it would go all day long. Of course, after COVID, life is a little bit different and we decided we're going to make this virtual. So we've been celebrating our, you know, our tour reunion and our test drive a tour guide thing for three weeks now. And every night we've been going to a different region. And as I mentioned tonight, we're going to Greece. So I hope you're enjoying our festival. We've been enjoying it. It's been so much fun. I do want to remind you, we're selling tours, but we're also just selling travel. If you want to travel, it's just important that you recognize that you can be your own guide. And we spend a lot of energy putting these books together. We write the best-selling guidebooks in Europe right now, and they are lovingly updated. We covered the entire continent. And of course, if you're dreaming about Greece, you can pick up this book and do it on your own, or you can let us do the driving and organizing and let you uh, connect with great local guides, and you can take a Rick Steves bus. Either way, you can enjoy the places that we're featuring during this festival. The most important thing is that you don't have a boring time. There's a lot of people going over there, spending a lot of precious time and money, and it's just okay, but it doesn't sparkle. We want your travels to sparkle. We want to be, we want to pour you a big, tall glass of Europe and be the swizzle stick, all right? That's what we're going to do tonight when it comes to Greece. One of my joys is to think that every year we put about a thousand buses on the road. Half of the people that sign up with our Rick Steves tour program are return travelers and they're coming back for more and more. I'm so proud of the job that our guides do, our drivers do, my amazing staff does, and it is there's no more way to just get feeling good about your work than to show something that you really love with passion and in a way that makes a lot of people glad they're with you. Of course, you can go on your own or you can take a tour. But we've got 150 guides standing by in Europe right now and we are so thankful to be back in the saddle coming out of this pandemic. We had a great year last year, and we're going to have an even better year in 2023. So this is what we've been doing this last three weeks here. And you can see we just have two more. We're in Greece now, the 28th. Tomorrow is Italy, and then Monday is our grand finale. It's going to be a huge party. It's going to, I actually invited our staff over. The, the whole room is going to be filled with <laughs> the people that make this happen. And we're just going to have a uh, celebration that we've survived this 22-night party. And uh, But I want to stress right now, if you have missed any of these events, they're all um, archived. They're all cataloged on our website at ricksteves.com. And you can go to any of these and just click and you can watch the 75-minute presentation. Just like in 48 hours, tonight's presentation will be in that collection of recorded and saved and archived celebrations of every corner of Europe, whether you're taking a tour, shopping for a tour, going on somebody else's tour, getting a guidebook and going on your own, or you just like to dream about European travel. There's a world of travel fun in this collection of festival evenings. Hey, remember, we're giving away tours. We've given away two already. And on Monday, we're going to draw two more names for our grand finale. And when you like to put your name in the virtual bucket, you have a chance to win that tour. It's your choice. 
of a seven day Rick Steves tour to our four favorite cities. You choose Paris, Rome, London, or Istanbul. It must be well over a hundred departures over the next two years that you can choose from. And we're gonna draw two more names on Monday. So we hope you can do that. If you're curious about how to do that, when you go to our website, look in the festival section right up on the top, it says the tour contest. Here's how you can enter. It takes about 30 seconds to enter. Also remember, everybody can't win the free tour, but everybody can be a winner with the festival discount. If you're going to sign up for a tour between now and the end of the month, if you use the promo code there, you'll save $100 per seat. And we've still got lots of seats available. As I said, right now, we're heading to Greece. And when we think about Greece, we've got 40 different itineraries. Greece is in the very southeast corner of all the country we do. You can see starting and ending in Athens and going down into the Peloponnesian Peninsula. This is the best 14 days we could imagine for Greece. And I've just been thinking about this itinerary as we've been preparing for tonight's uh, program. And I just love it. I've, I've led this tour many times in the old days. I wouldn't dare to lead it now because we've got the most amazing guides who speak Greek. Most of them are from Greece and it's just, we've got experts and specialists on Greece, but I've taken this tour and it was a delight. I took my family on this tour and uh, we start in Athens and then we go up into the mountains to the Oracle of Delphi. And then we cross the Gulf of Corinth and go into the Peloponnesian Peninsula, spending a night up in the high country in the middle, go down to Olympia, and then to the rugged, mysterious Mani Peninsula on the far south coast. We hang out in Monimbasia for a little while and up through the Byzantine side of Mistress, and then to my favorite town outside of Athens in Greece, Naplio. And we take a little side trip out to my favorite Greek island within easy striking distance of Athens, just a two hour hydrofoil ride back to Athens from the traffic free romantic island of Idra. And you finish with Athens. So that's the best two weeks that we can imagine in Greece and to help make sure that we have the best vacation possible and the best uh, event tonight possible. We've got wonderful guides and coming to us right now, 3 a.m. in Athens, Greece is Apostolos. Apostolos, thanks for being with us. Good morning, Rick. Kalimera to everyone from Athens, Greece. Actually, it is four o'clock in the morning. I was so you're one hour farther than Italy and France and Spain. Exactly, exactly. So it's, it's very early in the morning. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. I just saw you a year ago when you were coming into the hotel where we were, we were uh, I think we were filming. And the smiles on the face of your group just made me so happy. And uh, you guys were just finishing off an amazing tour. And we're going to rec- relive that right now. Apostolos, before we get going, I'm going to pour some uh, ouzo because we always like to have a, something that is appropriate to the culture to sip on as we're traveling. And um, tell us a little bit about ouzo. This is an important part of Greek culture. I have my ouzo as well. I have it here. And, you know, I poured some water on ouzo because of the anise, the anise it has. It is dissolved and you have this milky color. Yeah. And it is one of someone could say it's our national drink that we usually have it with seafood so we have to say yamas 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 Yamas. cheers yamas oh now that is very nice that's a strong licorice flavor and yours is cloudy and mine is clear because i have yet to put my water in it exactly you have to do that to make it lighter you cut it that was pretty strong what i just drank so, yeah. and then when you put the water in, it makes it cloudy, which is kind of like, that's the closest I'm ever going to get to being a chemist. Here we go. Uh, and I've got my cloudy. Good way to do it. This is quite light now. So the more water you put, the lighter you make it. So I think that's, this is really good. I like that anise flavor. And you find that anise flavor in pastis in France and in rakia in Turkey, and of course, ouzo in Greece. And this is, I, I just noticed my ouzo glass it actually says Uzo from Samos. Oh, Samos, beautiful island because oh. the, the best Uzo comes from, from the Eastern Aegean, from Samos and Lesbos, even northern mm-hmm. Greece. But this is one of the best Uzo you can get in I love Greece. A sim- I love a simple little souvenir that actually becomes part of your life. You know, every time I drink Uzo, I've got a memory of my time in Samos. And I drink Uzo about maybe once a year <laughs> when I'm here, but I drink it every night when I'm in Greece. That, that's beautiful. We have it with seafood, you know, during the weekend when we go to a little taverna by the seaside and we order our octopus or fried calamari, we're having a glass of ouzo usually because right. it's really 
it, it combines very well with seafood and fish. So it's really nice to try. Well, Apost Apostolos, you are a hero to wake up at four o'clock and drink a glass of ouzo with us. So that's just great. I want, I want to remind everybody, we'll have Q&A afterwards. You see the Q&A widget there. So if you have any questions for Apostolos, this is your chance. And now we're going to run around. we got about an hour, Apostolos, for Greece. So buckle up and uh, we're going to start in Athens. And if I understand, roughly half of all the Greek people are in Athens. What, there's 10 million Greeks and 4 million in Athens? What's the latest? The latest is uh, there's about more than 4 million people now in Athens at the moment. It's almost half of the population. When you think that the population of Greece is about 10 million people, Greece uh, has, Athens, the capital, has become a metropolis at the moment. So it has taken all these characteristics of a, of a big metropolis yeah. and it is spread. Um, and it is a very exciting city, obviously, because it combines the old with the new. And this is something unique. It's, it's a great place to be. And I like being on top of the Acropolis because I can therefore see about half of all the people in Greece from the top of that Acropolis. And I was up there with the Parthenon. And this is the sacred center of Ath ancient Athens. And of course, we'll go up there and get a look at the Parthenon. And we'll get a look at the Arechtheon with those beautiful caryatid statues. It's such a highlight. And as a tour guide, Apostolos, you need to be careful that we don't get caught up in crowds needlessly, right? How do we avoid the, uh, this would be the, when the cruise ships are in, the Acropolis is overwhelmed, but we're going in when everybody else is going out. Isn't that a good exactly. idea when possible? We, we go there around eight o'clock in the morning when the site opens. So we're one of the first groups that arrives. Uh, the picture must be taken around midday. So the best time to visit the Acropolis is early in the morning, 8, 8.30, or late afternoon. This is the best time to avoid the crowds, and definitely I recommend that also when you travel by yourself. Yeah, it's very, very important because uh, Athens is a huge cruise port, and everybody wants to go to the Acropolis. So if you go early or late, you get the Acropolis to yourself. And some of the big news in Greece is just at the foot of the Acropolis, this amazing new museum. Tell us about this, uh, what must be the pride and joy of the people of Athens now. This is this is our jewel of Athens. It's the, the Acropolis Museum. It was built about 14 years ago. It is built exactly opposite the sacred hill of the Acropolis. So you can imagine, you can visit the museum while you can look out of the glass window of the Acropolis. You can have this visual connection of the site and the museum with all the treasures, of course, they will found they were found up on the hill. And, and, and this what, connection is amazing, this feeling. And what I understand, Apostolos, the museum itself has a recreation of the Parthenon footprint in the same direction and the same scale. And then you can see the panels and all of the panels, the, the carvings that were left in Athens, not taken to London uh, by Lord Elgin, uh, you know, 150 years ago or whatever, um, maybe 200 years ago, um, they are in Athens. And it's kind of a, a statement that there are the blank um, squares there where the, where the carvings were, and those are in London now. And uh, Athens now has a, a good quality place where if they ever were gonna let uh, those carvings come back to their homeland, uh, Athens is ready to receive them, wouldn't you say, to put it politely? Exactly. We're looking forward to that. And now we have a big argument that, you know, all, all the marbles can be safe under the roof of the New Acropolis Museum. So we're still fighting for that. And I think it's a pretty good argument. And, and we're, we're getting close to that. Yeah. Uh, you know, London had a case to make before. They said, well, we have to protect it. And there's not an um, acceptable, quality, safe place for the uh, carvings to be in Athens. But that was a long time ago. And now there's certainly a good home for the uh, uh, Acropolis uh, carvings in Athens. They used to be called the Elgin Marbles, and now I understand London just calls them the Parthenon Marbles because the Elgin has a it's kind of a bad connotation to it. What a wonderful place for a little cafeteria or a lunch, the, um, the little restaurant on the roof of the museum we were just talking about. And our hotel is right in this same neighborhood as well when we stay there. On the other side of town, we have the National um, Archaeological Museum, and this is the classic old museum that ever since I've been going to Athens has the wonders of Greek art. And I love the fact that um, all of you and your colleagues have connections with good local guides. And uh, Apostolos, while you could do the tour yourself, over the course of two weeks together, 
you have several cases where we hire a, a private guide who's a specialist in where we're going. Is that correct? It is correct. And that's wonderful because we can get different views. We have the local guides in all the different sites in the museum. We're traveling all over the Peloponnese and, of course, Delphi. And at the moment, we can uh, we can see Fanny, our local guide for Athens, mm -hmm. guiding the National Archaeological Museum, which is, of course, one of the most beautiful and important museums in the world. And Fanny is a great guide, and you'll have really, Im really impressive guides for each of these sites. And the wonders there in Athens are just amazing. It's so nice to see that before you go out into the countryside. And, of course, we have to remember that Greece was found, really the modern state of Greece um, just dates back to the 1800s, right? Yes, exactly. We had the war of independence against the Ottomans because Greece was under the Ottomans for 400 years. Hmm. So there was a, a revolution in 1821 and in the late 1820s, we have the construction of the modern Greek state and the language and the religion of being Greek Orthodox, these two elements combined together, they help constructing our Greek modern identity. So when Greece and the Ottomans worked this out, uh, there was a big, I understand, a big swap of people because there were a lot of Turks in Greece and a lot of Greeks in Turkey. And there was a time when they, most of them went back to their, uh, you know, their ancient homeland. And we had a big change. And suddenly Athens goes from a small town to a giant city and the capital of a new country. Today, the old Athens that preceded the unification uh, is that small placa area just at the base of the Acropolis. And that's the touristic center where the characteristic restaurants are and the wonderful hotels and the beautiful pedestrian streets and all the shops. And then the, you know, just the big, um, exhausting, noisy city of 5 million people sprawls out from there. But the cool thing about Athens, maybe 5 million people, but you can do almost everything you want to do as a tourist on foot right there in the old center, can't you? Exactly. I mean, in Plaka, it's, it's the historical site, the historical village of Athens. That was the first area was developed like below the Acropolis. And it's so picturesque and beautiful. And it's a labyrinth of streets and there are nice coffee places and restaurants. And then it is connected to the modern town. So you have this antithesis, let's say, the old town with the new. And it's beautiful to explore. Mm, I was so eager to get back there and update the book. We were there filming our art show, you know, and then I just had to come back and, and work on this uh, guidebook here, which which our guides like you and, and your colleagues have helped us a lot, making this book work really well for people that uh, would rather get the book and not take the tour. But I'm so impressed at how Athens has changed in the last 10 or 20 years. It, it used to be very polluted and very congested and quite chaotic, and now it is it's got charm. It's it's an amazingly um, surprising. Uh, um, there's, there there are neighborhoods that feel cozy. Uh, there are pedestrian boulevards that would have been unthinkable a generation ago. I'm pretty impressed at how Athens has grown. What's your thought on that as a person who lives in Athens? My thought is because, as you know, we had the economic crisis happening. I think after the economic crisis. Little by little, young people, they started opening small businesses, coming together as communities. So we have the revival, the rebirth of certain neighborhoods in the center of Athens. Mm -hmm. You have this private initiative. And also, of course, the state ha has helped with some construction. Yeah. But I would say that the people, they started changing the city by themselves, especially the younger generation, which I really like it. Well, bravo. And I do feel that entrepreneurial spirit. I love the little mom and pop um, creative restaurants and the little guest houses and so on. And one thing you have to have when you're in Athens, this goes all the way back to my teenage years when I was backpacking through Greece, is a souflaki. I just, I just cannot get enough of a souflaki. And I got to say, you can't, I mean, there's decent souflakis outside of Greece, but there's nothing like a souflaki in Greece. And it comes with uh, a beautiful Greek salad, if you like. And then when we leave Athens, and I was just being nostalgic about this because as I mentioned, I took my family on our Greece tour a while ago. And I remember getting on the bus after Athens and you hit the road. And about an hour after that, it occurred to me, we're on the way to Delphi. And I had done that before with the local bus and you know figuring it out or driving. And it occurred to me, Apostolos, I'm totally stress-free. I'm above the traffic. I'm enjoying the view. I love my guide. In an hour, we're going to be in Delphi. It's just, and I thought, 
much as I'm an independent traveler in my spirit, you know, there is so much efficiency and ease uh, when you take a big bus with a great driver and a local guide. Uh, the bus is waiting outside of the hotel. You know exactly where you're going to stop on the way. You've got a guide waiting for you in Delphi. It's just a real delight. And we get up into the mountains, we get to Delphi and 2000, you know, well, centuries before Christ, the Greeks said that Zeus threw out two eagles. And when they flew all the way around the world, they came back together and they met at Delphi. And that signified that this is the center or the belly button of the world. And this is where the gods would communicate with the people. Is it something like that? <laughs> it is something like that. Imagine the Oracle of Delphi used to be the center of the ancient Greek world. Everyone wanted to travel there. And when you go there, you can see from, from the picture, you can imagine you're up close to the temple of Apollo and you feel something special, a great energy. And you have this beautiful view of oh. thousands and thousands of olive trees just below the valley down to the Corinthian Gulf. And this is like a, a beautiful image and emotion you can have being there. And this is our guide, Penny. I think I took this photograph 15 years ago and she's still our guide. She still meets our groups. And the great thing about um, Delphi is, you know, everybody went there to hear the wisdom from the gods. And a priestess would inhale some of the fumes coming out of the earth in this crack. And the, and the priestess would get intoxicated in Babel. And then the priests would interpret the Babel and they would give wisdom for the people that traveled all from all corners to there to get the, the advice from the gods. And in actuality, this was the database of the world because everybody who came in from all corners was interviewed. So these priests knew what this what the climate was doing, what the economy was doing, what the troop strengths were, what the concerns were. And when somebody else asked a question, nobody knew what was happening out in the far reaches better than those priests right there in Delphi. And they could give people some pretty divine wisdom, I think, on how to how to make the big decisions of their state. And something that goes hand in hand with that were games like the Greeks so love to do. What do we see here? Oh, this is the, the stadium in Delphi, because the Delphi had, of course, an ancient theater, the Temple of Apollo, but a stadium. And, uh, and the two members, the travelers, everyone can walk up to the stadium. And it is amazing to think how important athletic games were in ancient Greece. Why were they important? What was the big deal? Because we all know about the Olympic Games, but you had the, the, the games in Daphne as well. Because, first of all, it would bring people together. People would make truce, they would make peace, they, they wouldn't go into war, they wouldn't go into conflict. So it would bring people together and they would try to find a way to mm -hmm. sort out their differences. And also for the for the ancient Greeks, it was very important to build up the mind and the body, a combination of both. Not just the body, the mind as well. It was a well-rounded, they would celebrate a well-rounded person, right? Not just somebody who got every gold medal in skiing, but somebody who was also a poet and, um, and, a, and, a, and a philosopher and an athlete, I think. C creating a balance, a beautiful balance within you. Now we head south and we, we, we cross the Gulf of Corinth and uh, we go into the Peloponnesian Peninsula. This is a beautiful bridge that takes us effortlessly uh, across. And then we go to the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And when we look at this, it's actually connected to the mainland at Corinth um, well, technically that's cut now because you have the Corinth Canal, but, uh, and we drive right over that, which is really exciting. Uh, but when we look at the Peloponnesian Peninsula, to me, this is just a piece of land that is filled with wonder. And we're going to travel around that right now and going all the way to the South Coast. And uh, our first stop might be Olympia. And of course, Olympia is famous because 776 years ago, I believe it was, they had the first Olympic Games. And as Apostolo said, all the fighting ground to a halt. Everybody stopped. They sent their, their athletes to Olympia, had this grand pan-Greek uh, celebration. And if all of that togetherness didn't work, well, they were practicing their skills so they could be better warriors anyways, right? Exactly. That was the way to, to, to create peace uh, uh, among the people. And also, it used to be a sanctuary. Don't forget that all these places, they had a go to worship. So Zeus was worshiped in ancient Olympia. Now, um, Apostolos, you've been doing tours with us, I think, for five years. And um, 
Have you ever had a tour group that did not want to stand up on the uh, starting block and pretend like they were going to race? <laughs> I have the impression everyone wants to run. I think they're looking <laughs> forward to that moment where they're going to be at the stadium, at the original stadium where the Olympic Games took place first time 776 BC, every four years. Can every, you imagine the every actual place? Four years. Was it every four years until they disbanded all the pagan religion uh, 400 years after Christ or something like that? Exactly, exactly. So you can imagine. And then the, 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 they began again. They, they restarted in 1896 in Greece. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and they the restarted it then. Thank you. Yes, but it went for a thousand years every four years, and um, this was uh, my group when I when I took the tour myself. By the way, I loved I take I sign up for our tours now. I don't lead our tours anymore. I, people ask me if I ever lead the tours. No, I'm smarter than that. I want to take the tours. Our guides are so good. Every time I take a tour, I just marvel at how the itinerary is smart and how the guide knows how to organize everything. But here with our group, we lined up and we ran and we did really well. And then, as we like to do at each one of these stops, we have a local guide that meets us and resurrects that rubble, and then we can wander through and imagine what it was like back then. And what I'm very thankful for, Apostolos, is that at every one of these great um, out, uh, outdoor um, site, antiquity sites, whether it's Delphi or, or Olympia or Epidavros or Mycenae, there is a very good little museum that takes all of the artistic treasures out of the acidic air and away from any sort of damage and presents them in a beautiful, oftentimes air-conditioned way. And it's a very important part of the, of the visit, isn't it, to go into those museums? First of all, it's very important to preserve all this art, mm -hmm. but also after visiting the site or before you can go to the museum, and then you can rethink the site with what you've seen in the museum. That makes a great connection in your mind. And you can you can follow up the, the whole site. And I, it's very important. In all the places we visit, all these archaeological sites, there's always a museum in which, of course, we have a local guided tour. You know, I was just, as you were talking, I was just thinking, I loved the guide I had for Greece, and I would love to take a tour with you. And I know how much you love Greece and how much you enjoy sharing your culture and your history and your heritage and, and your, your country. You must think when the group flies in, we're reasonably smart people, but we don't know very much about Greece. It must be rewarding for you to see people steep on the learning curve and how much they learn after two weeks with you. What is that like? Well, it's a wonderful feeling. I really like the idea of traveling with with the group, the travelers, because they, they they see all this evolution of the Greek culture through the centuries, prehistorically, but up to today. So they can see a modern Greece as well. So people are amazed how this country has made it. And, you know, we're a contemporary culture and people appreciate because they can see how people live in the country. They can connect to the people. They yeah. can see all this development. And I think it's it's quite interesting for the people to see that that is not only ancient Greece, but also modern Greece as well. And you have colleagues that are just as um, um, creative and experienced and passionate about this as you are. And we have an annual tradition of having a guides a round table. Have you had your um, um, meeting uh, uh, yet with the other guides for the itinerary for the coming year? Yes, we have. We have definitely an annual meeting, sometimes more than once a yeah. year. And we always prepare ourselves. We exchange ideas and we meet up and there is a connection because, of course, we, we help each other. And there is a, a, there are great bonds among the, the tour guides. Uh, yeah, and you in came into our family. Every part of Europe. You came into our family just before COVID, and um, we used to have this tradition of coming here for those roundtables, but now we do it virtually with a web hookup, and uh, it works well, and uh, I just love the thought that you all get together and share notes, and I used to always tell my groups, uh, uh, you are the recipient of all the guinea pigs from the past tours, and you are the guinea pig for all the people who are going to take our tours in the future, and I love that because it's a beautiful evolution, and the thing I want to stress is these itineraries are not just thrown together. These are lovingly worked out itineraries with guides that have had a chance to try this and that as, year, as the years go by. 
makes a huge difference uh, because Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world and we really want to get the most out of our of our precious time as well as our vacation dollar on the south coast of Greece. I just love going down to uh, Cardamile and uh, Cardamile is just a, a small nondescript town with a historic castle on the top and uh, just a great place to settle in and 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 meet people who are close to the earth. This is Giannis and he scavenges around the hillsides and he has a shop filled with all of the herbs and the and the, the pharmaceutical herbs and the honey and the and the homemade olives and the olive oil. It's just you know what I mean to find these people that are so close to the nature and they just love to turn that into things that help our lives be better. Yeah, the, the travelers can see that the, the tour members because they can walk in, in, in the streets of the village or go out for a walk. Uh, there are so many hiking paths in Cardamil. It's beautiful, the beautiful view of the water. And you can see an old lady that she can treat you with some lemons from her. Nice. From her a little garden or they can give you some walnuts people are very very helpful and very giving and this is definitely an element of the greek hospitality and then when you've had enough hospitality you can just grab a couple of oranges and go to your balcony in your hotel room and watch the setting sun <laughs> i just love it and then we side trip into this rugged mani peninsula and it is the wild west of greece i think this is where there were lawless banditos and there are a depopulated area and there was all sorts of tribal warfare and what what does mani mean to to when you were a little boy what did you think about mani oh mani was like the wild west of greece uh, it is connected to proud people people are very proud for for the mani peninsula they, they they used to be clans fighting each other it was like a little bit more like a conflict war oriented society they built these beautiful towers made of stone that we can visit of course and you can see these byzantine churches they go back to the 12th and 13th century that mm. you can just open the door and go inside and see the churches it's it's a beautiful area and and the the, the combination of the big blue of the sea and, and 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 the golden grass and the olive tree it's beautiful colors of the landscape oh, yeah and here we are with with my group in in one of those churches and it's amazing to think that this is what 800 years old and it's you just walk in and you've got this amazing art and heritage in a village that sees very few tourists and we like to explore with our groups and it's quite thought provoking when we get a little little quiet time in the Mani Peninsula and then we come to the rock of Gibraltar of this part of the Mediterranean Monemvasia and I love this because we have a great hotel a family run hotel that's very comfortable on the mainland and then we can walk across that causeway and we see what must have been a formidable fortification in its day and there's a walled medieval town at the base and we can hike hike up to the top and explore those ruins this is the town of the historic town of monambasia and then we can hike up to the top of that rock and see the last surviving uh building up there it's a byzantine church and to go to the top of monambasia uh it's just a uh, one of the great you know king of the mountain experiences that uh, a, a tourist can enjoy traveling in Greece, isn't it? It is an amazing place, Monembasia. You can imagine a hidden town behind a rock island. And what I find fascinating always when I tell the, the tour members is that it's been, everyone tried to conquer it because it was towards the Middle East, like for the trade routes, very important during the Byzantine time. So you, you had everyone was trying to, to conquer it. The, the Franks, um, the Venetians, the Ottomans, even Catalan pirates mm -hmm. and, the, and the Pope, everyone wanted to conquer for, for, for trade reasons this island. And it, it's fascinating through the centuries. And if you were trying to just survive and you saw that rock, you would think, perfect. <laughs> this is a natural fortification. We can have our town at the bottom. We can have our church at the top. And to this day, it's quite a beautiful place to travel. And then after all that exploration, we go back to the hotel and what happens? Oh, what happened? We're having the cooking demonstration. We have this lady, her name is Rena. She's a fantastic cook and she's teaching to the tour members how they can cook Greek food. You know, food and Greece go together. Wow. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And this is just, I can, I, I, I really want to come and experience this because we weren't doing that back when I took the tour, but that's what I like is 
all of you local guides, you get together in your annual round table and you say, hey, I experimented and tried that. It didn't work very well. Let's not do that again. I experimented and tried this. It worked great. Let's all do it again. And we develop friends who are real people that love to have a group of Americans come in and share. You know, it's a cultural exchange. Exactly. You, you make friends, first of all. You you integrate into the, the culture. and But also, you learn how to cook moussaka, jajiki, yeah. Yeah. klaba. So food brings people together. Now, if you were a standard tour, you'd pay $100 extra for this optional excursion. But on our tours, every group activity is included. So there's not a hint of what do we charge for this. People are on board. We They've paid up front. The guides paid. The bus drivers tipped. The guides tipped. The hotels are all figured out. Uh, and uh, the, the activities are included. And that makes it even more fun to know that, hey, we are all in this together. And we're working our tails off to make sure you have the best, most interesting experience possible. And we want a good dose of Byzantium. Everybody needs a good dose of Byzantium when they go to Greece. And I think the best place to get a dose of historic Byzantium is in the leading uh, center of Byzantium during the Ottoman uh, uh, rule. I believe that's fair to say, and that is Mistress. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, between uh, 13th and 15th century, it was a big center of the Byzantines, very important town. Mm -hmm. And uh, we visit churches and you have an amazing view of the Valley of Sparta. So you can imagine you're up there and you can think at some point down in the valley, they used to be one of the most important city states of Greece, yeah. Sparta, that we stop also there for lunch. So yeah. it's a very nice combination. Yeah. And then at the base of the uh, Byzantine ruins is a Byz is a Orthodox uh, convent that's still alive and well. And we visit that and we actually have some time with the sisters, don't we? Yes, we do. We see the sisters. Uh, I think there must be about three of them at the moment. They're there. Uh, someone always is welcoming us and we can see where they live and you know they treat us with a little cookie a little a little sweet and it's nice they're very they're very open it's it's a convent but the nuns they they, they like to to talk to the people and yeah. and come and together you know when when i went there with the group i didn't know this but i because I, I it was my first time on the tour and there was many things i just had never done before and i came in and they greeted me like the long lost um, uncle or something. Oh, Rick Steves. And I didn't realize that we had a long tradition with these sisters and our purchase of a, a, a lunch there or uh, their little handicrafts that they make is an important part of their economy. And we go there and we have a nice uh, time with them and we buy a few of the things that they've made. And uh, it's an it, it contributes to their work. And uh, I was so touched by that because uh, I was just thankful they knew who I was before I knew who they were. Yeah, they, they make beautiful embroidery and we, we help them to, we support the convent. Yeah. And it's really important for them. So they're always they're very helpful, uh, very thankful to yeah. us. It's beautiful. And then all, you know, wherever you go, you can find these characteristic towns with the delightful fishing boats. And um, as a tour guide, it must be fun to have people enjoy your cuisine. And it's such a fun convivial uh, social cuisine because it's family style and you get to try a lot of different plates. And uh, I think the faces there indicate how much fun they're having. And uh, meze is a fun, what, what is your philosophy as a tour guide when it comes to feeding the groups, uh, Apostolos? I think, I think it's great to serve food. So kind of appetizers, meze, this is what we call them. They're different small plates. And when you travel and you have your free time and you go to a Greek taverna, it's nice to take small dishes to try a little bit of everything. So on tour, sometimes we have a main course, but sometimes we do family sharing because this is the way we do it in Greece. We sit down on a table, the friends, the family, mm -hmm. and we share smaller dishes. And this is the best way to be introduced to the food culture of a country. Very nice. And, and Greece really lends itself to that. Every meal is like a festival. In fact, it's very common for the meal to become a festival with music and dancing. And, you know, it's kind of Zorba the Greek touristy. But if there were no tourists there, they would still be doing the Zor Zorba the Greek kind of fun, wouldn't they? Yes, they would. And we have so many different uh, different types of music and also dancing from different parts of Greece. So it is a part 
of our culture, when there is a wedding or there is a baptism and there's a big party, we do dance the Greek dances. We have, you know, disco music, but also we do have the, the Greek dancing. So it's a part of the culture. It's not only for the tourists, yeah. it's for ourselves as well. And, you know, I've been at a lot of nice, fun dinner evenings with my tour groups over the last 40 years. I have never had a group that danced on the tables with our wait staff and our friends in the restaurant as we had in the Peloponnese Peninsula. And we just had the most unforgettable evening. And it wasn't just because of the ouzo. It was just genuine fun. We spilled out into the streets. And for me, that's a beautiful part of a beautiful vacation. That's great. You know, the Greeks... And of course, the two members, we become, we become very expressive with dancing. And you have the opportunity to see that on tour as well. You do. You sure do. And I'll never forget the smiles that night. We just had a great, great time on our way to Nafplio. And this is my favorite city outside of Athens in Greece. This was actually the first capital, I think, of the modern country of Greece back in the 1800s. And today I'm taking this photograph from uh, a 999 foot or stair, staircase, uh, step staircase with a Venetian fortress, a reminder that this was part of the Venetian trading empire for a while. And Nafplio, there's the fort I'm talking about. And when we think about Nafplio, we see the, the Greek flag proudly flying there. Um, it's just a, a city that has a lot going for it in itself. And it's also a great jumping off point for Epidavros, for Mycenae, and for the Isle of Idra. Tell us a bit about Nafplio. Oh, Nafplio is one of the most beautiful towns in Greece. First of all, it was the first capital of Greece in the late 1820s after its independence by the Ottomans. The Ottomans were there, the Venetians. You have this beautiful neoclassical Greek architecture. You have combination of different architectural elements. It's just beautiful. And you have this unique Venetian fortress that was built in the beginning of the 18th century uh, on the top. So you, you have all this mix of cultures. And it is beautiful just to walk around the city. And Apostolos, maybe I didn't tell you, but we stayed here when we made our Easter TV show. We were celebrating Easter all across Europe. And the great thing about if you're doing a TV show on Easter and, and you only have so many crews and so many uh, Easter Sundays, Greek Easter is a week away from the rest of the uh, Christ, Christian Easters. So uh, it changes from year to year. But the year we were there, we were in Rome for one Easter. And then seven days later, we were in Nafplio. And I'll tell you, the uh, festivities there were amazing. And we made friends with the priest there. All the priests, uh, they've got this uh, wonderful sort of welcome. And his name was Dionysus, I think. And I'll never forget, this is with our guide here, we were learning to appreciate the incense. And he asked us something like, do you know incense? Like we hadn't ever realized why there is incense. And what is your understanding of the importance of incense in the Orthodox Church? It is, it has a symbolic character. It's like your connection to God. It's like, like praying to God. Mm -hmm. by, 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 by leaving all these aromas. And um, it's, it's a connection. It's a connection to God. And, and that's why we, we have this incense like rose and mirror. Um, and this is what it symbolizes. And, and it changes depending on what atmosphere the, the priest wants to create. And, uh, but we were so welcomed there and anybody who is going around Greece, you're going to find it's a very accessible culture. Uh, here's another one of those Phoenician fortresses. If you see a winged lion, you know that's the lion of St. Mark's. That's the symbol of, of Venice. And they had an empire that stretched all the way to the Holy Land. And I'll never forget the breakfast room of our hotel looking over Nafplio and the, the wonderful family that runs this place. I think we've been going there for 20 years. We stay in one of the most beautiful hotels in Nafplio. It has a beautiful view of the old town and the port and the seaside. And it is family run. And this is about our hotels. They're run by families. We get to know the families. And everyone is having nice conversations with them. We have a very nice, uh, homely made, handmade breakfast. And there is a terrace and everyone is laughing. I, I like this idea. We become a part of of the family of the hotel and and the tour members appreciate that we we certainly do and in napoleon we have a chance to go to a, a wine shop which is more than a wine shop it also talks about the liquors uh, uh here we're what, what what would be happening here 
What we do, we have a, a, a Greek liquor demonstration. So it's like a tasting. It's a wine tasting, Uzo. And we go, not just, it, it is one of the oldest liquor stores in Afplio. Mm -hmm. So it goes from generation to generation. And there we can try the different liquors. But of course, they've been explained by the gentleman that owns yeah. the store. Nice to have an education with your Uzo. Yamas. Definitely. Yamas, yamas. Yamas, all right. Yamas, everybody. Oh, yeah. And more dancing and more dancing. And then I fell into this thing. They said, OK, Rick, um, you're going to do this. And uh, <laughs> I, I forget exactly what it was, but I had to do a push up and pick up the glass with my with my lips in this sort of thing. And it was it was a lot of fun. Um, it's just sort of the, the festivities that erupt after the dinner is eaten, isn't it? It is beautiful. We, we learn different dance moves because we have the opportunity during the tour, to, if, if someone wants to participate in one of the Greek dancing, and this is what happens. There are special moves that you learn and to show that you're having a great time. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that was a few years ago, but I, I sure have good memories of it. And that's one of the great things about travel. Now, from our home base of Naplio, we can go to one of my favorite sites in the ancient world. And when we go to the the, um, the citadel of the Mycenaean people, Mycenae, uh, famous for its Lion Gate, uh, we got to remember that this place was as mysterious and ancient to Socrates and Plato as Socrates and Plato are to us, okay? This was a thousand years before Socrates and Plato, and they looked at these huge stones and they didn't know how it ever could have been done by mere mortals. And they said, this could not have been done by people. It must have been done by the Cyclops. And throughout ancient times, this was called Cyclopean architecture. And here, I, I just love to use this gate as an example of a corbelled vault. Of course, the Romans had a round vault. Everybody talks about the round Roman arch. What a great thing that was. Well, here we have the example of the opposite of a Roman arch, which is a corbelled vault, not very strong, only as wide as that uh, a lintel can be. Is that a lintel across the, the top being held up? Yeah, it, it, it is a, a, it's a big stone yeah. that it helps, it helps a lot the balance of uh, right. the gate. And what I would like to add about the Mycenaeans, it is a mystery and the travelers are fascinated because we're talking about 1,300 years BC, as you said, 1,000 years before the golden age of Athens and the Acropolis and the Parthenon. It's amazing. So the greatest uh, uh, prehistoric civilizations in Greece. We have to emphasize that. 1,400 years ago. Um, I just, it's just mind blowing. And you walk through there with your guide. And you learn about the mask of Agamemnon and all the treasure trove that was found there. But now I think you'll see most of that in the museum in Athens. And then we go to the Tholos tomb. And I just love to say, think that you can measure the architectural sophistication of a society by how big of a dome it can make with no interior supports. And this built, what, uh, 1400 years ago or something, like 1400 years before Christ, was for uh, more than a thousand years, the biggest dome that had ever been built. And uh, today it's like a stone igloo. It's it's quite a, it's one of the most impressive uh, early ancient sites that we'll see anywhere in the Mediterranean, I would think. Definitely. We call it also the beehive tomb because mm -hmm. it looks like I mean, you can imagine it was covered with soil. It was hidden uh -huh. and created this dome with this huge rock. So it is an engineering miracle. Now we're talking about 1,300, 1,000, 400 years BC. So it is amazing to think that something like that was constructed in and Greece. If I understand correctly, Apostolos, that was the biggest dome until the Romans built the Pantheon, uh, 100 or 200 years after Christ. And also, you can go to Mycenae from Naphleon, and you can go to Epidavros from Naphleon. And this is probably the greatest theater from antiquity that we can see today with an amazing acoustics that still work. Everybody gets to try it. Do you have any fun demonstrating the acoustics there? Oh, yes, we do. We always, our, our um, local guide, Patti, demonstrates the acoustics. And the amazing thing is that still today, we have the festival of Epidorus or the Pidavros every summer, where you can go and see an ancient Greek play. I've mm -hmm. seen 
amazing place, even Shakespeare, because Shakespeare was inspired by the great tragic writers. Wow. So it's still in use. Nice. So that's a good side trip. And then a short boat ride away, we get to the beautiful island of Idra, H-Y-D-R-A, pronounced Idra. And the amazing, Jackie, Ones, Jackie Onassis, by the way, like to hang out here, didn't she? Um, but this is a, a town that has no cars, no trucks, just donkeys for transportation and little speedboats that are serving as taxis to get you around the island. But what a delightful place to have your Greek island experience. And what's impressive to me, Apostolos, about the island of Idra, it's one of my favorite islands in the whole Greek sea. And it's one of the handiest islands to Athens. And it doesn't feel like it's a suburb of a big metropolis. It's just two hours away by a fast boat. You don't need to go all the way to, you know, across the sea uh, overnight on the boat or something. It's just a quick trip from Athens. And uh, when you get there, you realize this is for real. There's just donkeys to carry people's gear around. And then wonderful, you know, laid back island sort of ambiance and, and uh, relaxation and great restaurants. Oh, what do you feel when you finally get to Idra with your group? I, I think it's one of the highlights of the tour. And it's, it's a wonderful way we end the tour in Idra. And imagine a car-free island away yeah. from the city. Oh. And when you step into the port, you're in a time machine. Mm -hmm. You go back to the beginning of the 19th century because there have been regulations to preserve the island the way it is. So you don't have any big hotels, any yeah. big buildings. You can mm -hmm. walk everywhere. There is a fantastic network of footpaths. You can go for swimming. It is one of the most beautiful islands. Do you know this place, Apostolos? Oh, yes, definitely I do. Definitely. It's, this is my cool. special place. It is especially, there's a fantastic taverna there. You can see to, yeah. to the left-hand side with yeah. wonderful seafood. And you have this view. Kamini. Kamini. I think Kamini of the little bay. It's yeah. just, just 10, 15 minutes walk from Idra town. And yeah. you can go sit down and have your 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 glass of uzo. I have my glass of uzo there for the, for the sunset. It's a, one of my magic moments. All over Europe, I have a handful of places. And ah, to see the sunset from Kamini from my little desk, right, or my little desk, my little table right there with some nice munchies. And then another ritual for me is to open my shutters in the morning and greet the day. I just, there's something about, because when this, I, I, I learned what cock crow means when I was on Idra, you know, in, in the, pre, before there was clocks, they said, we'll wake up when the roosters crow at cock crow. In Bible times, I think they woke up at cock crow. And here you wake up at cock crow also, and it sounds like it's an insane asylum for crazed roosters because they're all just going crazy when the sun rises and you greet a beautiful day. It is, it is a lovely way to begin the day. Imagine you don't, you don't hear any motorbikes, any cars. You wake up in the morning and you hear the roosters and the donkeys, the uh -huh. animals of, uh -huh. of the island. And, and you just feel calm. And, and this is the best way to begin your day. Calm, it's so nice. I, you know, all over Europe, I love those shutters. I love to just, I, a lot of times I almost, you know, I just wanna greet the day with some physical action and I open the shutters and there it is. And one beautiful thing about the hotels that we choose with our tours all over Europe, you're very likely to have the old fashioned shutters. And you're very likely to be situated in a place where you want to open the shutters and see what's outside. Whereas if you go for a high rise, you know, international class hotel, the windows don't even open in those. You don't have anything near like a shutter and you're out on a freeway off ramp instead of right in a traffic free island. This is fundamental to good travel. And part of your travel should be the joy of opening your shutters in the morning and greeting the day. And when you're on Idra, it's a nice day to greet. Uh, people can make friends with, a, find their little restaurant, which is, um, <laughs> this is Leonidas, and, uh, and, and uh, they used to greet us, and uh, there's so many opportunities to have a characteristic meal on the island. Let's talk a little bit about the food that we'll experience all over Greece, uh, Apostolos. Um, first of all, the Greek salad. Uh, tell us about a Greek salad. 
Okay, first of all, I, I'm going to start by saying what we don't put in the Greek salad, because there's a misunderstanding. We never put lettuce on the Greek salad. Okay, let's start with that. Okay. <laughs> so it, it definitely should have cucumber, uh, tomatoes, um, mm -hmm. uh, onion, if you want peppers, olives, of course, and olive oil, and of course, feta. On feta. It just occurred to me, my girlfriend's allergic to um, dairy, so she can't have mozzarella. And I love a salad caprese, which is uh, tomatoes and mozzarella. So we have tomatoes and uh, basil and uh, feta. And it's our own caprese with, it's a Greek caprese, really. And Perfect. it's like a Greek salad. And it is so good. And when you have it in Greece, I remember when I was a teenager, Apostolos, I had never tasted a tomato like what I found in Greece because we grew up with tomatoes in the United States that were frozen and served all year long or whatever. I don't know. But there's something about tomatoes in Greece and the cucumbers and the olive oil and the feta. It is just an explosion of taste. And I never get tired of a Greek salad. You're right. I mean, don't forget, we live in Greece, Mediterranean climate. Everything comes straight from the field. There are markets everywhere. The, the travelers can experience going to, to a market to see where we buy our food yeah. and vegetables. So it, Greek food can be very simple food, yeah. but yeah. It has to, it, when it's organic and it's fresh and it comes together, it makes the best combination. And right. we have a great variety of vegetables and fruit. So if you even if you don't want to eat meat, you can eat vegetables every day because it's oh, a great yeah. variety. Easy. And look at that. I'm just gazing at it. I'm just I'm just fantasizing about that thing. And uh, you probably have a Greek salad every day. And, you know, you, you don't get tired of it because it's it's so fresh. It's so part of the land. It's so right. I love to sit in a restaurant where the octopus are uh, <laughs> out, out hanging in the in the breeze. What, what are they doing? Are they drying them that way? Yes, yes, they're, they're they're drying them that way, and also it's a way to attract the customers. Yeah, so what it sure, it sure attracts me. I'm a sucker for that. <laughs> so we have a, just a lot of fun eating, uh, a lot of meze. I like what you're talking about. It is it called meze? The little plates? Meze, little meze, little meze, and we're having you know our happy hour. We're yeah. in the, when we're in neither. Oh, the stuffed tomatoes. Oh, and the peppers. Oh. I love it. Oh, baby, look at that. Yeah. It's oh. One of the and fruit to the sea. I mean, you'll never and you'll never get tired of the fresh seafood. It's pulled right out of the sea. Yeah, the, oh. the mullets. I can see the fish and and the calamari and of course the octopus. Oh, it's, yeah. Oh, look at that. Jeez. Oh, I I remember this was um during the holiday times. I was here with Easter. Everybody had a goat or a lamb on a spit in their backyard. I mean, it's quite. A, we cook a turkey, you know, for Thanksgiving. And that's a big deal for a lot of people. That's the biggest hunk of meat all year long. But in Greece, it's lamb or goat literally on a spit, turning slowly, right, over the fire. Yes, this is the way we do it. And every family does, especially in the countryside where you have more space, every family is having, they're having their own animal on the spit. And they go from one house to the other and they yes. treat each other. And they, they taste it. And they, it's, it's sort of the, you know, it's kind of like what the men do, you know, how men pretend they're really helping out and they put on a, a barbecue uh, apron and, and they do the barbecue. Well, well, yeah. they're just kind of doing a little toy or they carve the turkey. Well, in Greece, the men are watching the spit go around. And then this man heroically took the lamb or the, or the goat or whatever this is. And I'll never forget Apostolos. He pulled the piece of metal, the, the skewer out and the whole animal just went blah, 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 blah. and then yeah. he organized it and put it on a plate. It was the most elegant way. That, of, of that means it was, it was very well cooked and it was a time to take it out of the fire. These mm -hmm. people, they know how to cook. So they compete each other. You know, they try. They do. You see people the looking one. over the fence. You see people looking over the fence. What's he doing over there? You know, and then they taste and they, and they joke around. It's a beautiful thing. And, and, and they start cooking at six o'clock in the morning. You have to put the fire <laughs> very early to, to have lunch at two o'clock. Uh, it's great. There's so much good food. And then, of course, we have some desserts. What are we looking at here? Oh, this is, I can see this is the bugatza. It's, it's, it's like a custard cream with phyllo and custard sugar and cinnamon on the top. Mm. So it's 
Mm -hmm. We have so many bakeries. Don't forget in Greece, there's a bakery in every corner in a town and in Athens. So you can you can try so many different pastries. And, and there's and, baklava shops that are just filled with honey, honey desserts, right? Honey and nuts. Honey and nuts and, and uh, all these layers of phyllo. And we make very nice uh, um, yeah, syrup of, uh, of, of, of uh, honey. Uh, and, and then there's nothing like Greek yogurt. Oh, what can you say about Greek yogurt? Greek yogurt is, is is a part of our food culture because you can have it for breakfast. And on tour, we have it in all breakfast. You can have it as a choice. But also you can have a lunch or dinner. You can have just, just if you want to have a light dinner, you can have some, some yogurt. Some and berries, can... some granola, drizzle some honey on it. And that's my Greek breakfast. I just love it so much beautiful food and that's the part of travel that we really love here we have one of our happy groups just look at the faces i just whenever i bump into a group i just look at their faces and i just i think this guide is doing a great job they've been blessed with good weather and they're having a great trip and if it's at the end of the trip i'm thinking bravo to the tour guide of course when you're in greece you always have good weather yeah definitely i mean the, the weather in Greece is fantastic and the light and the sun and the temperature, it's ideal temperature, uh, it's springtime. You can see we're there in Nidra and with the group and we've been walking by the seaside and you see the, the daisies are in bloom, yeah. beautiful weather. And I learned That's that uh, Julianne on our Monday night travel cruise, she was on this tour and she actually took this shot. So uh, Julianne has uh, traveled with you. Hey, um, Apostolos, can you just walk us through in a, just like in one minute, the route again we've been looking at all these things and i want to stress people can do this on their own it's very realistic to to grab the uh, the rick steve's uh, greece guidebook this guidebook honestly is designed so you can do our tours without us you can pick up this book and then you can do all the hard work and driving and arrange the hotels and save some serious money and have this the, the great vacation on your own you'd probably want to give yourself four more days to accomplish what we're going to accomplish with the bus because we've got it all laid out in order so there's no fiddling around but you could do this on your own and that's the purpose of this book of course this book comes with the tour and when apostolos or one of our guides meets the group in athens everybody has this book so they know what to do on their free time and they know how to prepare for where they're going and so on but Apostolos, um, just please review with us what you would do in the 14 days here. Again, just in like literally one minute from Athens all the way around back to Athens. Of course, we spend two nights in Athens and then we make our way to central Greece, to Delphi. Then we, we cross to the Peloponnese. We go to Lagavia, 3,200 feet high in the villas for one night. Then we go to the Mani Peninsula through Ansin to Olympia, where we spend two nights in the seaside villas of Cardamili. After that, we go to Eastern Peloponnese in Monemvasia for two nights. After, we go to Nafplio through Mistras. We spend two nights in Nafplio, and then we make our way to Idra, crossing a 30-minute boat ride to Idra from the mainland of the Peloponnese. We spend two nights in Idra, then we go to Athens and we spend one night in Athens. It's nice to get back to where you started because by that time you, you, you are a friend of Athens. You've been there, you've done most of it, and you have a chance to have a little more time in Athens to do what you want to do and fly home from there or travel on. I want to remind people that when you take a Rick Steves tour, this is very fundamental to our philosophy about being a tour company, all of your group sightseeing is included at no extra cost. Small groups and um, friendly groups. And I can say friendly groups because of the way we promote the tours, the way we advertise the tours, we shape the clientele, you know, and I, I don't want to get into all the details, but we know how to figure out who does, who, who will enjoy a Rick Steves tour and who might find it a little bit too authentic let's put it that way uh and we you know there's different tours for different styles of people so for the right people our tours are just perfect and that's why many people have taken 10 or 15 of our tours uh, but for the wrong person there's other tours that would be better for you but we have um we have a, a like-minded group of young at heart people uh 20 to 24 to 28 people on a bus buses typically have 50 seats so basically you get two seats to yourself well, I'll tell you, a lot of companies, I mean, the easy money is in uh, more people on the bus. If you're doing a tour company and you go between 30 and 50 people on the bus, there's a lot more profit right there. But we find we cannot do our tours with more than 28 people and have the Rick Steves experience. So that's a full group for us. 
the full-time services of a professional Rick Steves guide, and local experts that complement his or her work. You've met Apostolos. We have a whole um, uh, team of Greek guides that uh, work with Apostolos, and they're all just, I'm so proud of them. Uh, all the group transportation, accommodations in characteristic, memorable, funky hotels sometimes, and that's part of the joy of traveling. Uh, all your breakfasts, half your dinners, and the trip of a lifetime, God willing. That's what you get with a Rick Steves tour. I want to remind you, you can go to ricksteves.com, and I'm not going to take you there right now, but I am so committed to having this website be a depot of information. You've got, uh, what, uh, 15 years of radio archives there, 500 hours of radio interviews. I mean, there's so much on Greece if you just dug into the radio section. We've got 150 TV shows. Just click, click, and you're watching it. we got a couple of wonderful shows on Greece. If you want to see the Greek Easter, you go to the Easter special, and you can check that out. All the scripts, and the scripts are annotated with information that connects you so you can turn those travel ideas into your own experience. Uh, you've got the Monday Night Travel link. And from there, you can look at 100 different Monday night travel episodes, and a lot of those would cover Greece. And of course, you've got our tour program there. If you click on the tour button, you'll go to the tour page. You can then click on the various countries. And if you click on Greece, you'll see that, well, we're almost sold out on our Greece tours this year. I just checked it. There are three tours out of about 20 that still have seats open, May 27, June 24, and June 26 in 2023. So we're really thankful that sales are great and Greece is really hot. <laughs> it's hot temperature wise, and it's also hot from a sales point of view. And uh, there's three departures that still have seats open. And of course, the wait lists are worth getting onto because things do open up. And uh, we'll be doing it all again in 2024. So you got lots of information right there. If you have any questions about our program, go to ricksteves.com. We're very busy on social media. If you want to take a look, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we have a lot of fun connecting with people that way. I want to stress again, if you're curious about what you might be doing on a tour anywhere in Europe, check out our, our archive of TV shows. So all the shows, everything we've ever produced is right there, including our new um, Art for Travelers series. And much of that was filmed in and around Athens. Uh, it is a six hour swing through the story of European art from the earliest prehistoric art right up to the Parthenon, or right up to, the, to Picasso and the art of our generation. Um, I do want to remind you, we have an app the app is free and it's designed for people who want me in their ear to give you a guided walk through the most important 60 or 65 sites in Europe. Uh, this is a very popular app, especially if you're on your own and you don't have a tour guide like Apostolos. This can be your free option to that. Uh, whether you're taking a tour or going on your own, be sure to uh, go into the App Store and look up Rick Steves Audio Europe and uh, in about a month maybe two months, we're going to be updating every one of the tours in there. I did 50 of the 65 tours in the last couple of years, and it is time for you to get on board with that app if you'd like to have a guided tour at your own tempo. Uh, once again, we're going to draw two more free tours on Monday if you want to come to our party. It's our grand finale uh, in 48 hours, uh, and uh, that's always fun to uh, give away a few tours. And I want to remind you again, if you sign up for any tour until the end of the month, until January 31st, with the festival promotion code, you get $100 off on those seats. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about Italy, and it's going to be just a general celebration of the culture of Italy. I'm joined by David Tordi, one of our guides from Orvieto, uh, just a couple hours north of Rome. And we're going to be talking about the joy of Italian culture as it pertains to all the great tours we've got going on in Italy. And then after that, we have our grand finale of our tour program. So all of our guides would like to remind you that we are here and we'd love to be a part of your upcoming travels. All right. Hey, I think it's time right now to get back with Julianne. And uh, Julianne, I would imagine we've got a few questions for Apostolos. Yes. And as you mentioned, Rick, I was on tour with Apostolos in 2019 on the Greece tour, and it was a lot of fun. And one of my favorite memories of Apostolos is the little Greek lessons you'd give us throughout the trip. Could you teach us just three Greek words that are good for travelers to know? Okay. First of all, Kalimera when you begin your day this is the best way to communicate with the first person you the first greek person you see you say kalimera good morning with a smile they're going to respond to you and say kalimera efharisto that means thank you i think this is a very and then 
you can uh, say also yasas. Yasas means hello and also goodbye. It's like ciao in Italian. So you can use it the whole day, which is nice. very, very Yasa. That's a good word, yeah. And in the morning you say calamari. Yes, exactly, exactly, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that's my problem. I always say, I always think calamari. No, that's for lunch. What do you say again for good morning? Calimera. We say calimera. It means good day. Calimera. 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 And llamas. Like, yeah. Uh, so you, when, when you pronounce it a couple of times, you practice, you'll be fine. Calimera. So now it's calimera from Athens. All right. So it Julianne, is ingrained you, in my head. Yeah. Did you use those words, Julianne? Yes. Yeah. I remember clearly Apostolos every morning saying calimera. <laughs> And Afaristo, thank you. I don't say it right. And uh, Yamas for cheers, like you just did, Rick. And nice. Calispera, good evening. <laughs> hey, wow. Yeah. yeah, almost fluent. No. Excellent. Excellent, Julian. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Let's see. This is an interesting question. Eileen was wondering, is there any push to add color back to the ancient statues that are now all just white? Hmm. Well, the, the ancient Greek statues of course, you know, the marble statues, they used to be painted with color. When you're in the Museum of Acropolis and you go and visit the Acropolis Museum, they show you how it was before and after. And this is something really nice. Obviously, now we don't do that anymore because of the protection of the statues. But you can have this opportunity to see how it was before and after. Because many times people think that the, the marble was just white and not painted. But it was mm -hmm. painted. And this is something people are amazed. And also at the Acropolis Museum, you can see all the different colors they used to dye, to, to color the, the statues. Sharon is wondering, Apostolos, is Greek mythology part of the curriculum in Greece, Greek schools? It is. I mean, how we can take it out? I mean, we're Greek. So <laughs> we've been learning Greek mythology all our lives. So you start at primary school, kindergarten primary school with Greek mythology. And then we connect Greek mythology with history from second and third grade. So there's like a very nice connection between mythology and history. And of course, yes, we do learn. And we learn also about, of course, the Iliad. And, and the Odyssey by, by Homer, you know, the epic poem, we, we pay a lot of attention to that. Mm -hmm. It's our culture, so we have to be taught, and we're learning ancient Greek as well. Oh. And Rick, a question for you, or just common questions that we always get from our viewers. Who composed the intro music that we hear every evening? And where did you get the shirt you're wearing this evening? <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, um, Jerry Frank is a beautiful uh, composer in Seattle and he composed our theme music and we're very thankful for that. And uh, my shirt is, um, I was just in a real good mood for Greece. So I, I put on one of my summer shirts today, even though it's the depth of winter. This is, um, it's by a company called Dash Hemp in, uh, in Santa Cruz, Dash Hemp. And uh, I, hemp is such great material for, for clothing. And uh, this is just a great travel, travel shirt. Rick, you mentioned earlier how you were fantasizing about eating a Greek salad. And Jerome was wondering for both of you, what are two Greek dishes that you could both fantasize about? Maybe Apostolos first and then Rick. Oh. The, the, or just the, a favorite dish, Apostolos. Two favorite oh, dishes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love fish because we have a great variety of seafood and fish. So when I find the opportunity, I go to the fish market and I buy fresh fish. So I would say healthy, great variety. I'm pretty um, predictable in my, what, I, what gets me all excited about Greek food, um, a souflaki pita. I just called it a souflaki, but it's actually a souflaki pita with the little greasy uh, piece of pita bread that wraps around the uh, souflaki, the, the meat and the little salad. That is the greatest thing for a, 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 a quick lunch. And when I was a kid, it's nostalgic because I spent a lot of time sleeping on rooftops in Greece or sleeping free in churches or, or just stowing away. I used to I used to buy the ticket from I, used, um, I shouldn't say this in public, but just between you and me, Apostolos, I used to buy the ticket in Brindisi only to Corfu. And then I would 
failed to get off the boat accidentally and I would have to go all the way to uh, the town by Olympia. What is the town where the where the boat ends? It's uh, Catacolo. Catacolo, yeah. So I would I would just kind of stow away on the boat. I was doing all sorts of very, very bad things as a impoverished backpacker. And when I got to Athens for a dollar, you could get the souffle pita. And it was just the greatest thing. And I love it to this day. Just a simple, greasy um, pita bread with that souffle in it in the salad. Um, there's a little place right by the metro station next to our Hotel Hera uh, that I just love. I think you might know that place. And I just sit there and it's a it's a five dollar meal and I get my souffle in a, in a drink and it's nice. Um, it's a full meal. It's a full meal. It's a full meal. And then if I'm in a great mood, I like to share a baklava with somebody because uh, baklava is so rich. But when it's done right, it's heavenly. The tzatziki was one of my favorite things. And we had that as part of the cooking demonstration in Monvasia. Oh, yeah. yeah, tzatziki. <laughs> yeah. I remember I, I was, um, this is from Samos. And in the old, old days, our, our Turkey tour used to finish in, we'd take the boat from Kusadashi, the last stop in Turkey, to Samos. And we'd finish on a Greek island so people could travel on that way. And my one of my favorite things to do on the Turkey tour when we got to Samos was to buy everybody uh, their Greek, their welcome to Greece dinner. And it was always the meze, the little tapas. And it was just a celebration of all of this variety and everybody tried different things and a great introduction to Greece. Tonight we visited Idra, which is a beautiful island. I really enjoyed the time I spent there. And probably the most other top two islands that people visit are Santorini and Mykonos. Do you each have a recommended island outside of those three? Uh, yes, can I, can I say, I, I mean, I like the, the group of islands of Kiklades, so I like Serifos and Sifnos a lot, and Folegandros, they're beautiful islands. Now, these and are also, the, Cicla the Cycladic islands, yeah. So, Cicladic, yeah. so I mean, you around Delos, Pasorini, yeah. Mykonos, it's a group of islands, so we have uh, Naxos and Paros, all these islands. So I like Sifnos and Serifos a lot, uh, spending mm -hmm. money my vacation. And I would say in another group of islands up in the north, in Sporades, there's the island of Skopelos, which is very green. It's not like Kiklades, dry, uh, with like a lot of pine trees and turquoise water. So Skopelos is beautiful as well. I mean, there's so many, it's so hard to choose. But now just to answer the question, I'm just telling you some of my favorite islands. You know, uh, my experience is with a cruise ship. And a cruise ship, I know a lot of people have feelings about cruising, good and bad. Uh, and when you're on a cruise ship, you're going to go to Mykonos and you're going to go to Santorini. <laughs> and I've been there several times on cruise ships and it works. You can have a great time on Mykonos and you can have a great time on Santorini. My favorite experience on a cruise ship was jumping ship, leaving the cruise early at Mykonos. And to sit there on Mykonos, knowing all of the cruisers are back on that ship and it's sailing away. The people on Mykonos have made their money. They've put their postcard racks away and now they come out very Greek, ready to just enjoy their island. And to sit at that little tavern and watching the cruise ship go away and with it all of the intensity and all the commercial hubbub and all the tourists. And I had the island relatively peaceful. That was a beautiful thing. And many times, no, several times, I have actually um, decided strategically to leave a cruise ship on the last stop without going back to the main, the terminus where you finish the tour, because I just wanted to be on the island or be where, where, where the action was without the cruise there. And it's a very good tip. And uh, Mykonos is quite nice, as is Santorini, when there's not a cruise ship in town. And we have time for just one more question. And I think that often when people think of Greece, they think of the hospitality and the people. And this question is for both of you. Apostolos, what is your favorite part of your own people, the Greeks? And then Rick, you can answer second what your favorite thing about the Greek people is. Uh, it's it's very hard because I have to, you know, think of my own people and and uh, you, know, you can be very critical, you know, of your of your own people, your own country. But I can I have to say their their warmth and uh, and the fact that um the, you can communicate with the people and i like that i like i like the good communication with the people there's there's mm -hmm. a very very good connection with uh, the people they're, they're ready to listen and communicate and 
I I enjoy that. This way, I would say the warmth of the people. They're ready. They're ready to communicate with you. Nice. And I like that. I like the resilience of the Greek people. I mean, history has been uh, history can be hard on different peoples, and Greece has had a lot of um, challenges over the centuries. And uh, you don't feel an, an, a negative edge. You just feel a love of life in Greece in a in a in a in a strength in an even keel and uh, an ability to to take the cards they're dealt and make the best of it and um, and carry on. And I feel that in Athens, Athens has been through so many challenges lately. Lately, meaning in the last twenty years or in the last two hundred years. I mean, it's just an amazing story. And to meet the people that have have surfed through all of those crazy waves and to still have such a love of life to me is an inspiration and apostolos that's one thing we like to introduce to our uh, travelers uh, you know americans it's easy when you're a big country like ours to be ethnocentric and to think we're the norm and to think that we have the struggles or we have the baggage or we have the knowledge but you know we have to share that and we all have the struggles and we all have the baggage and we all have uh, the the experience from our our past and uh, the beautiful thing about traveling when you do it thoughtfully is that we can compare notes and we go and, home with a better empathy for each other and we maybe we go home happier than ever that we live where we do <laughs> but we also go home being on more friendly terms with the rest of the world and that's thanks to guides like you apostolos thank you and, and what i would like to add is like when, when we travel with tour members and the travelers and they hear people's stories. Mm. Not only they connect, they identify mm. themselves with the stories. Right. People have similar stories. And Apostolos, I thank you so much for all you do. Best wishes with your tour guiding. And uh, Julianne, thanks for moderating tonight. And uh, we are uh, we're just uh, we could spend all night talking, but we are out of time now. And I want to thank everybody who's tuned in for celebrating Greece with us. And uh, we hope to see you again. And in the meantime. Happy travels. Happy travels. See you on the road. Thank you. Good night, Apostolos. Good morning. <laughs> Good night, Julianne. Good night, Rick. Good night, Apostolos. Good night, everyone. See you tomorrow as we go to Italy. <laughs> <laughs>